Hi, my name is Molly Hellerman. Thanks for joining the session. Let's jump right into the fun. A few months ago, the CTO leadership team gathered for our annual offsite. One of the exercises that we did together was to draw and discuss our superpowers and our kryptonites. Essentially, the things that really got us excited and those things that brought us down. My kryptonite was mean people. Essentially, people whose comments I let drain me and bring me down. And it's something that I've known about myself for a long time. And I can actually pinpoint the moment when I had this realization. It was almost 20 years ago, and I had my Women's Premier League debut with Chelsea Ladies. It was a really wet, rainy day. The pitch was um, miserable, and no one could seem to get their, their passes to where they really wanted them to go. But we were doing well, and we were winning. But for our coach... It was the worst game ever, and he was yelling and screaming from the sideline. Even our central midfielder, who ultimately became one of England's captains, couldn't do anything right uh, for, for our coach. And then it got to be my turn, and I was the goalkeeper, and I, I got the ball, and it was a goal kick, and I placed it on the ground, and I backed up, and I kicked the ball, and it went to where I wanted it to go. But in the process of doing that, I fell right on my bottom. And at that moment, the coach threw up his hands, turned his back, and started screaming and for me my heart sunk and something that had that i had loved for so much some for so long something that i really enjoyed this sport of soccer had turned into some, very something very transactional and frankly a job and it made me want to actively not be that person that would make anyone feel that way ever in their life so I started to look and understand what was happening in this field. How could we ensure that we were delivering messages well, that we were creating a positive team environment? So fast forward about three years, and I was coming off coaching college goalkeepers, uh, U.S. regional team members, and I was practicing more and more of this positive uh, approach. But it really got tested when I was handed this team, the Big Best Friends Diamond Stars. Now, this was a group of seven-year-olds who had never played soccer before. Literally, the first practice, they showed up in leather sandals um, and little dresses. And in the United States, if you haven't played soccer almost from the womb, uh, you are at a disadvantage by the time you get to age seven. And we were. We were getting crushed on the field uh, by you know tens of points. And well, I had a decision as a coach to make. I had to decide, do I try and train them in the actual, uh, all the very specifics and techniques of soccer? Or do I try and make this something that was really fun for them and that, um, that they'd enjoy throughout their life? And obviously I chose the latter. And so what we did is we started to create new ways to look at the game. And one, for example, one of the things that we did is we said, you know, as opposed to scoring goals, our goal is going to be to try and get the ball across the halfway line seven times. And the girls knew this, the parents knew this. So we'd get the ball across three times and we'd be counting out loud four, five, and the, the excitement would start to rise six. And on the seventh time we'd get it across the halfway line, the girls would be all excited. They'd throw up their arms. The parents would be cheering. The other team, of course, would grab the ball and go down and score on us. But we didn't care because we had accomplished that goal together. And personally, I set the goal for myself that every single girl would come back and sign up for the next season, which they did. So what I'd like to do with our remaining time is to dig into the theories behind this power of positivity to share with you some practices you might consider and sprinkle in five actions that you can try at home. So let's start with a theory. Starting on the negative side, because that was the experience for me and how it sparked this, or, or sparked this was um, this, this insight from Charlie Maher, who is, uh, he's a por uh, performance specialist. He works with the Cleveland Indians. He works with the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, consults with the National Football League. And what he's found is that when environments are really negative, it hampers performance and it distracts people from what they're trying to do. It takes them out of the moment. And we know this is true. Think about uh, if you're, you're working on something and you've just you've published it or you've submitted the code, whatever it may be, and then all of a sudden you get an email back or someone comments on the, on the post that you have and it's negative. And this moment where you were so excited, ready to jump into the next thing that you were doing, has now brought you down and maybe you need to step away from the computer, go for a walk, think about something different. So we know this is true in our own life. What additional research by Mary Fry out of the University of Kansas has found is that we respond to these negative triggers, but we also respond to positive triggers. 
And so fostering that caring, positive environment really does make a difference. At Atlassian, this is something that we actively embrace. Twice a year, we put out a survey called Vital Signs, and it looks at four different categories through a number of questions. Now, one of these is around culture. And what we ask is, you know, are we creating an environment that supports us and helps us work effectively? Because we know that's a key area to great performance and great teamwork. Now, if we look at the positive side of things, Barbara Friedrichson out of the University of North Carolina tells us that positivity builds and broadens and it opens us to learning and taking on new challenges with confidence. Now, when I think about the teams that I want to be a part of and teams that I want to lead, this is the type of team that I want. Teams that are excited to take on new challenges and are doing so with confidence. At Atlassian, we have huge goals and oftentimes we akin them to going to the moon. And I'm sure your companies have equally ambitious goals. But we know that it's not just one person that went to the moon. We know that it took almost 400,000 people to get one person, two people, and now many people towards the moon. So like those that landed on the moon almost 50 years ago, um, we need our teams to be ready to embrace these challenges to help us all accomplish our goals with confidence. So let's test set positivity in action. Uh, this is a little bit of a demo time, but obviously a remote demo time. And we're gonna use a rock, paper, scissors tournament of champions. Now, many of you are likely familiar with the rules of rock, paper, scissors, rock beats scissors, scissor cuts paper, paper covers rock. And, you know, you find a competitor. Generally, it's the best of two, three, obviously not two, but three, uh, five, seven, etc. But best of three rock, paper, scissors. And um, the winner moves on to the next opponent. Now, the thing that I like to throw in here, which really tests this positivity factor, is that when you lose, you don't just go sit down or stand to the side. The loser actually becomes the number one fan of the, de of the person that defeated them. So if, if you and I were playing and you beat me best of three, I would get right behind you and be cheering for you, um, calling out your name, giving you thumbs up, high fives, etc. So let's have a look of a tournament playing out with a couple coaches. This is the beginning when they're in their one-on-one -on -one competitions. And then you can see that the winners start to amass a following. And finally, it's down to two teams, and we'll call it the red team and the black team, given the shirts of the final competitors there. Now, you can see that it's a pretty intense competition. And right now, the black team is up 1-0, and the red team comes back with a scissor-cutting paper. Now, what I'd like to point out here is that the guy in black just lost, but look at his teammates' faces. They are actually all smiling and enjoying this uh, experience. And so with the score tied 1-1, with the winner taking the next battle, you will see that Red comes back with a rock crushing scissors win. And again, what's really interesting about this picture, and I want you to look at it, is that essentially there are 20 losers on the screen and only one winner, but they are all smiling. And as Mary Fry says, this, po this positivity optimizes motivation and there's really no downside to creating a positive team climate. So this is the first action for you. Foster positivity. There is no downside. Now that you've seen some proof points on the power of positivity, I wanna take a deeper dive into the emotional fuel tank. Now, the emotional fuel tank concept is fairly intuitive wise. It's something research-wise that I came in contact about 20 years ago through Positive a Coaching Alliance, but it's something that really does exist in all aspects of our day. So think about your day. Let's say you sat down to the computer and you had your coffee, but making the coffee, it got a little bit spilled and you didn't have enough milk to put in it. And now it's somewhat cold or colder than you wanted. And you didn't have the charger and you had to go find it and put it all in there. And finally, you're ready to watch this. Your tank may be a little bit lower than someone who maybe woke up, got their tea or coffee, uh, it was perfect, came right to the computer, fully charged, everything worked and came up 
perfectly. Their back is feeling awesome. They have a perfect chair and they're ready to watch this. Their tank is likely more full. And the reality is I can do nothing about how you came to this presentation. Uh, but what I can try and do is to make sure that your tank is more full when you leave this presentation. And this is something that is actually uh, reinforced by Chris Voss, who's a former uh, FBI uh, lead in a uh, kidnapping negotiation. And he talks about one of the tactics that he uses in dealing with fugitives, and it's called labeling. And essentially it's understanding how full people's tanks are and then validating it and coming up with ways to, to use empathy and understanding to get a more effective end. So how do we fill tanks and how do we drain tanks? We can fill tanks through praise and appreciation. The trick here is that you have to be very truthful and specific. You can't just say, oh, you look good. That, that's helpful. But if you say, oh, I really like your, your colored socks or I like your Zoom background, whatever it may be, that is uh, very truthful and specific and it fills tanks. Uh, recognizing people when they've done something great. Uh, listening, just being an open, open set of ears to listen. And then all the nonverbals, whether it's smiling, high fives, um, and holding the doors open for people, things like that. We drain tanks through criticizing and correcting, uh, using sarcasm. As we know, sarcasm is really only funny to the person who uses it. Um, it, never, it never works and it actually drains tanks. Ignoring people, um, and then a whole host of nonverbals. Think about the last, um, you know, if you're in a meeting and you're presenting something and it's clear that people aren't watching or they're on their phone or they're looking at something else, um, it can be really draining. And, and we know this from our personal experience. So let's have a deeper dive into what this actually looks like so you can continue and start to practice these things. Praise and appreciation. I like how your blog gave me some specific actions. I appreciate the time you spent with Katie getting her on board. Or even celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, and other wins with the team, whether that be uh, remotely or in person. Recognition. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for whatever it is, whatever someone did to help you out. And then triumphs and learnings. So giving high fives. And these don't have to be in-person high fives. We actually have a weekly meeting where we started off with high fives. Anything that someone wants to say, you know, congratulations or thanks for doing this. I appreciate how you stepped in there. And then Atlassian actually started a project called the Happiness Project where we start our stand-ups. Uh, where people talk about something they're grateful for. And it can be anything from, you know, I'm grateful I got that code out to, I'm so happy that my kid got himself dressed this morning. Uh, but very quick, but it's a good way to connect with each other and recognize each other as people. Then of course, there's a the whole listening. How are you doing? And here's the trick. This is a really pro tip. Wait for the answer. Oftentimes we just say it, but we're not waiting for the answer and it's clear that we're not listening. So be a listener there. Um, how was that meeting for you? Asking how people uh, came, out of, came out of something. And then of course, even if you're in a hurry, you can still do this. On a scale of one to 10, how was your meeting? How was your project? How was your weekend? How was your day? Um, and then you can follow up with it. If someone says, oh, my, my day is, I'm at a four. Wow, then maybe you need to spend some time at the beginning of, of, your, of your session with them or your meeting with them to unpack that and be able to be in a productive place moving forward for whatever it is you really wanted to discuss. And then, of course, all the nonverbals that we talked about, holding the door open, uh, giving a high five or an elbow or virtual high five, especially in this, uh, in this current environment, going for a walk with people, and then, you know, maybe dropping a post-it um, on their desk. And it doesn't have to be, again, a physical desk, but dropping them a note uh, in Slack or sending them a little message on email is, is always useful. And then, of course, smiling. Um, we all have this ability, but smiling is a wonderful nonverbal. So before you think this is too fluffy, uh, this is actually rooted in a lot of research. Now, this is Albert Bandura. He's a professor at Stanford who received the National Medal for Science for his work on this concept. Along with Robert Rozier, they showed that when tanks are full, people are more willing to stick with something longer and work harder. And again, when I think of the type of team that I want and type of teams on which I want to be a part, this is the type of team that I want. And I'm guessing that this is the type of team member that you want to. So that gets us to our second action. Choose to be a tank filler. So it'll take some work on your part, but I wanted to dig into some of the practices that you can deploy to help make all these things happen for your teams.
So let's start with Watson and Crick. So Watson and Crick are famously credited for discovering the structure of DNA. Now, we can talk about all the other people that probably should also be credited with that, but we'll save it for another presentation. And what I wanted to talk about is a memoir that uh, Watson wrote in 1968 called The Double Helix. And in this, he describes the roller coaster of emotions that he and Crick experienced through the progress and setbacks on their work towards winning a Nobel Prize. And what they described was that when they had positive feedback or they shared a breakthrough and got that positive reinforcement, they could push forward really quickly. But when they found errors or received harsh criticism on their work, they were unable to move forward and, and found themselves as, as he described, in the dark days. And this is something that is supported by recent research by Teresa Mable and Stephen Kramer in their book, The Progress Principle. And they found um, through their analysis of over 12,000 diaries kept by knowledge workers across seven companies, this concept of the progress principle. And that you can actually boost the emotions and motivations of people by appreciating the small wins that they have. Um, and that that is what actually makes people more productive in the long run and feeling that they are appreciated and cared for in their environment. So that's our third action. Identify and celebrate little victories. Now, switching gears a little bit, this is Tokyo. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot to take in. Um, and we could probably look at this picture for several minutes and pull out all the little moments that are happening there as people cross the street or have a coffee or have a conversation or pick something up. Uh, but regardless of whether your office is in Tokyo or sitting by yourself in your office, we know that every day we have about 20,000 moments. So little seconds that are put together. And this is work that was described uh, by, by Daniel Kahneman and that it determines the quality of our days. And while we have positive and negative points in our days and neutral, our brain is really only taking that measure of positive and negative and keeping that track. And it contributes to an overall score on our mood. And over the past several decades, uh, science have explored the impact of positive to negative interactions on our role in our work and our personal life. Now, they've actually found a specific ratio that can be used to predict uh, with remarkable accuracy, everything from workplace performance to student achievement to relationship success. Now this work began uh, with noted psychologist John Gottman out of the University of Washington. And along with his colleagues, Gottman conducted a longitudinal study over 10 years with couples. And he was able to predict with 94% accuracy whether newlywed couples would stay together or get divorced. And he would basically score their positive to negative interactions in one 15 minute conversation. So sort of looking at positive and negative in 15 minutes, he could predict whether people would still be together in 15 years, excuse me, in 10 years or not. So he did this by applying what he dubbed as the magic ratio. So any guesses on what that is? All right, well, the magic ratio is actually five to one. So five positives to every negative or criticism that you make. Does that seem hard or easy? Yeah, I think it's actually pretty hard, right? You actually have to think about this and interact and engage with all those around you. But the good news is that it's 100% up to you uh, to fill tanks and how you can do that. And when you practice, and when you start implementing some of these tools, it becomes a lot easier. So we talked a little bit earlier about some of the tools and tactics that you can make. Here's some additional ones that you can use. The first piece is to create forums for others to help you. It doesn't have to be just on you to fill everyone's tank. You don't have to be the one to make sure that everyone on your team and in your environment is at a five to one or better. So use others, have them help you. A partner team members for a day, um, have someone have them be in charge of checking in on each other and testing where that where each other is at hearing about days identify a player of the day for yourself so let's say you have a large team or, or even if you have a small team pick one person a day that you're really going to focus on and listen hard to and watch and understand 
and see, you know, are they, how are they doing? Does it seem like their tank is full? Does it not? But at the same time, really flood them with positive uh, feedback. And then choose your words. It seems small, but it is actually really important. I'll go through a couple of these. If then statements. So we know, especially if you've done something a lot of times and you're working with someone that is doing something for the first time, or even if you're working with an experienced person, that we often have the tendency to say, just do this. Um, and, and it makes it easier and faster. But if we can change our wording to an if then statement, it puts people in control. So for example, if I am asking someone to uh, rephrase the wording in a messaging to the company because I think that it doesn't really focus enough on, on, the, um, on the personal side of things. I could say, you know what? I think you need to really humanize this note a little bit more. Or I could say, it seems like you have a lot of great points in there. If you were to add a little bit more of a, of a human perspective and really personalize it and think about the person reading it, it might be read with a little bit uh, more attention. And so right there, it's putting the power into whoever's writing its hands and giving them the opportunity to, um, to feel in control. The second one is to ask permission. I know we all often have a lot of feedback that we want to give. People have to be in a place to receive that feedback. And so ask permission. Say, hey, I have some feedback on that. Would you like to hear it? Most of the time, people do want to hear it. If they say no, then we have to honor that. But it's okay because we know that they probably wouldn't receive our feedback anyways. And what I've found is that people generally do come back to you for that information and want to know how they can make it better. On the flip side, ask for input. It's always fun to have someone ask you specifically for your input on what they're writing, doing, thinking, etc. And finally, as we've talked about many times, say thank you. So we're going to do another demo. If you can grab a paper and a pencil or marker, crayon, whatever you have around, I'll give you a second to grab that. And I am going to ask you to draw a rabbit. All right, I'll give you 10 seconds to draw a rabbit. Five seconds. Three, two, one, stop. All right. Now, here's some rabbits that I had some folks draw for me. Some people got 30 seconds. But um, as you can see, they're, uh, they're all different types of rabbits. Now, I want us to practice actually getting to this 5 to 1 ratio by starting with getting to a 2 to 1 ratio. So pick a rabbit on this page, look at it, think of something positive about it, think of something that you might correct if given more time or better artistic talent, and then pick something else that you like that's positive. I'll give you an example for this one. I really love the fluffy tail that you put on this rabbit. It's probably gonna need some legs to hop and really make that tail shine. But the ears do give it a good sense of energy and motion. So this is, um, you know, it's a silly way to look at it, but at the same time, it's proof that we can get at least to the two to one and ways that you can continue to get to that five to one ratio. And with that, that's our fourth action. Increase your positive to negative ratios with your teammates. Make it your job to really get those up because we know that the default environment is likely negative. And so we want to be the ones that are helping our teams get to that positive ratio. Now, this is our, our final section that I wanted to talk about. And this is a statue that's outside the UN's World Health Organization headquarters in Switzerland. It commemorates the 30th anniversary of the eradication of smallpox. For most of us, and especially for me, I associated the cure for smallpox to Edward Jenner's work in the late 1700s. It was actually one of the first books that my uh, dad had read to me. But what's interesting about this statue is that it recognizes the team of people that enabled that cure to happen. And in their tribute, when they sort of unveiled this statue, they really didn't mention Jenner at all. They talked about all the individuals who helped to drive the eradication. They talked about local governments, healthcare workers, donor agencies, NGOs, village leaders, even people that provided food and shelter to the vaccination teams. Now we know that Atlassian, the concept of team is central to everything that we do, how we work and how we envision making an impact on, a, on the world. And to do this well, we need really effective teams. 
Now, Google did a project back in 2012 where they set out to understand what makes the most effective teams. They called this project Aristotle. And essentially, they were getting at different pieces that will allow teams, regardless of their structure and regardless of their working ways, that said, what makes the most effective team? And what they found were five specific traits to successful teams. And the number one trait, the number one norm that they found for successful teams was psychological safety. And psychological safety, and I know there's a lot of talk about it right now, but psychological safety, as they defined it, is a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up or taking risks. And as I read this, essentially they're saying that team members are tank fillers. So that gives us our final action. Encourage a positive environment. Now, as we look at these actions, I want to review them one more time. First, foster positivity. There's no downside. Second, choose to be a tank filler. Third, identify and to celebrate little victories. Fourth, increase your positive to negative ratios with your teammates. And fifth, encourage a positive environment. Now, given that I started this out with a soccer story, I would be remiss to not end with a soccer story. So for those who don't know, this is Pele. He's arguably one of the best soccer players to have ever played the sport. He's led the Brazilian national team to three World Cup championships. He was declared a national treasure at 17. He scored a thousand for, uh, goals in first class matches in under 10 years. Uh, all, multiple places named the recipient of um, international peace awards and athlete of the century, etc. But I think the true teller is that when his team, Santos, traveled to Nigeria, in 1967, there was a civil war going on and they declared a ceasefire for 48 hours so that people could watch the match. So obviously a uh, pretty good player. Now, this is him in a match and you could see he's kind of taking the ball probably right out of the air and to his foot and then, um, you know, maybe he dribbles or shoots off of it. But it's a simple move. It happens many times in a match. Now, this is him practicing that same simple cut and it's very very hard to find pictures of Pele practicing and he's likely practicing thousands of times for each time he used it on the pitch and similarly these concepts around emotional tank filling they aren't difficult you know nothing I've told you today nothing we've discussed is something that's uh, rocket science uh, but it will take some practice and it's something that takes practice over and over and over again and so my encouragement to you is that you know, as we talked about, you have 20,000 moments every day and you have so many people that you are interacting with throughout the day, whether it's in person, online, um, or otherwise, and start practicing. You can start practicing at Summit as we have conversations around it, but you can practice every day wherever you may be. So with that, thank you so much for joining this time. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.